What's going on, Trenton Thunder fans? Welcome to Feel the Thunder, your official Trenton Thunder podcast. My name is John Bodner, and I am next to my co-host, Jeff Hurley. And we're excited to bring you another episode. Uh, Jeff, the sun is shining. The Hamilton St. Patrick's Day parade was this past weekend. Um, the water is on at the ballpark. Things are coming together. It feels like baseball season. Spring training is in full effect. It's it's one of the best times of the year. I've been here for 20 years, and the time that water is turned on in March, that is, it's like a national holiday yeah. for Trenton Thunder. All the alumni that are listening can <laughs> definitely feel for us through, through the off season. But yeah, it, it's a, it's a great time of year. Uh, things are going to be starting in motion at this ballpark and and we're really going to be going through a heavy spring cleaning over the next week or so um, with our first event uh, at the end of this month. It really feels like we just hosted the, the championship game like not too long ago and we've gone through a whole off season. Um, you know, we, we continue to talk about the ideas that, that we have and um, the promotional schedule that, that's been going on. And um, But now, I mean, you know, this the weather that we're, we're experiencing and the spring training, you know, that's when it really hits. When, you know, we're, we're past pitchers and catchers, we're playing baseball, we're playing games. Um, you know, we, we talked offline about the Buster Only tweet with the Phillies, uh, his pick for the World Series being Phillies over Yankees. So that has our market excited. Um, you know, and, and we're just a couple of weeks, you've mentioned our first on-field event, but we're just a couple of weeks away from Major League Baseball's opening day. Yeah, this, this weather really gets people uh, interested even more interested in baseball obviously spring training's going on and people can watch the nice weather those that go get to go down uh, experience it but when we get days like this it really puts you in the mood that you wish there was a thunder game tonight yeah. uh, to be able to witness but but really it's just you know there's going to be so much going on this month um, you're going to start seeing even more predictions of yeah. world series just like buster only i think that would be a phenomenal matchup great for our area mm -hmm. um but yeah there's going to be so much and so much going on with with just the thunder alone we have a lot of things that we're going to release we have things going on right now you're going to hear more and more so it's going to be an exciting month to uh too as we uh, continue on this off season yeah speaking of of the releases uh, you know that we have going on um we really we, this week we kicked off a, a lot of our ticket and merchandise deal so um single game tickets for all 40 home games have yet to go on sale uh that date will be upcoming so make sure you're in tune with all of our social media uh and our our thunder insider to get your details there uh but we really released our first uh, ticket and merchandise, which is the uh, Class of 2024 jersey. Um, obviously, you know, whether it's college, high school, um, kindergarten, you know, wherever you're graduating Carson from. Carson might need a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, it's something, it's, it's obviously an accomplishment. Uh, so we're encouraging fans to come out on June 5th. Uh, to grab that exclusive uh, jersey offer. And who doesn't ticket. love a jersey? Right. I mean, they're they're amazing. Thunder on the front, number 24 on the back. Rep your graduating class. Um, and then this week is going to be full of it. So Monday through Thursday, we're going to have special releases going out. These are always fun. It's exclusive items. It's limited to these packages. Um, and we've seen this, the you know, grow in popularity in our industry. Yeah, and it's, it's a way, like you said, the single game tickets aren't on sale yet. That'll come later on. But uh, uh, it's, it's it's that exclusive way to get your ticket to maybe one of the, the those games that you're interested in that you saw on our promo schedule that's been slowly released. So, yeah, just an exciting time. I always look forward to it. It just means more and more is going to keep coming out. That means we're that much closer to baseball. And I'll tease this, too. The, the remainder of the um, the ticket and merch deals all fall within June. So that's our premiere month. Tickets are going to be hard to come by for individuals, uh, you know, once they're released to the general public. So I highly encourage, you know, people to get their tickets any way they can right now, whether it's through your group, whether it's through these exclusive offers, because uh, these are definitely going to be hard, premier seats, especially hard to find, uh, you know, once individual tickets go. And we've seen some of the artwork. We're, we're excited. Yeah. Uh, I wish I was graduating something. <laughs> I, I'll try and figure something out where I'm able to get a uh, graduation jersey. But yeah, certainly a, a fun time here at the Thunder. Yeah, so uh, to transition, we, we, you know, had a great conversation with Greg Caserta, um, you know, the, the, just the other day and, and excited for everybody to get to listen to that. Um, you know, Greg obviously being with us for a couple of years, um, you know, great person, great broadcaster, really looking forward to seeing how his career continues to develop. But we talked a lot about this with um, Adonis 
uh, the, you know, uh, in episode one with the history uh, and tradition of the Thunder manager. Um, and we, you know, we mentioned a little bit with Greg, but we didn't get too much into it. Uh, the Thunder also have a great alumni when it comes to the broadcast. Um, you know, there's so many names that, that come to mind, you know, especially, you know, obviously number one, Tom McCarthy with the, you know, with the broadcast booth being named after him. It's just another uh, thing that the Thunder really set the tone for when it comes to our traditions. Yeah, obviously Tom is is the first one and, and him being local with the Phillies, but Andy Freed yep. and Tom were in the same booth. Andy's down in, in Tampa. So that certainly is, is a start to, to that tradition. And it, it might not just be those former broadcasters in, in the major leagues, but uh, have gone on to do you know college yep. sports and uh, sideline reporting and, and, and so many other things. Josh Mauer yep. in Milwaukee, Justin Shackle is, is with the Yankees. So, uh, and the list goes on and on. So we've been lucky enough and it, it's kind of that stepping stone um, to allow these broadcasters to continue to grow. And, you know, we were able to talk to one of them, uh, Greg Caserta, this, this, this episode, but you've had the opportunity uh, on a, a previous podcast yeah. to talk with Tom McCarthy yep. and, and, and Andy, Andy Freed. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it's great to hear their stories and, and, you know, what they experience. They have a little bit uh, of a different experience when it comes to Thunder baseball than maybe me and you have. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's great to hear those stories. And, you know, with Greg, I still remember getting that call and I'm just thinking to myself, uh, a you know, he has such good experience. We would be lucky to have him. We had an offer out to someone else at yeah. the time, but it just worked out. And, and Greg was phenomenal here for two years. But we had we had a lot of fun too. It yeah. was it was you know he was professional, great broadcaster, but it was also that fun um, you know times that we had for him in the booth and out of the booth. Yeah, I said it to you right after we you know wrapped up our interview with Greg. It, it amazes me, and it, it was the same way with Andy. It was the same way with Tom. Um, the way they're able to tell these stories, to, it's like it was yesterday. Um, they're so detail-oriented, uh, and, it, and it shows the passion they have for their craft, uh, the dedication they have for it. Uh, and, and Greg was just a phenomenal interview. We went, we went a pretty long time with him, uh, you know, almost 50 minutes. And I'm really, really excited for the, the Thunder fans to hear from, from Greg Caserta and um, absolutely going to have him back on. But, so, but we, we even had yeah. a chance back in when we went and visited the All-Star Game in Richmond yep. that even one of our former broadcasters, Jay Burnham, yes. was our craft beer tour guy tour guy around richmond virginia uh, so they they do more than just broadcast yep. they, they they are uh, they're truly ambassadors they are they're, they're ambassadors to the team and and we're very fortunate enough for um a lot of our you know broadcasters and and many staff members to continue that role after they're done with the thunder you yep. know tom obviously supports us whenever we when seems like whenever we make an ask um greg you know will wear that bat dog rookie hat until <laughs> Uh, if it, it falls apart and and uh, Victoria sends him another, another one, one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so really excited to to get the Greg's interview. But before we get there, uh, just a little fun uh, we're gonna have. Um, so we now, not we just now, me. not just you. Okay. Uh, so last week you you ranked all your ballpark food. So I figured, um, you know, the next thing that we're we got to talk about is is you know we've you've been here to, you know close to twenty years or, or just over twenty years. Um, I've been here about ten, but we're we're also both grew up Thunder fans. Yep. So we have a lot of memories uh, in the ballpark, whether it's on the field, in the stands, in the front office. Uh, you know, we've done it and we've seen pretty much since 1994, both of us, um, you know, having a presence here. So I thought it would be fun to draft our favorite Thunder players Okay. Uh, that have, you know, taken the field in the ballpark. Um, i got to start going on Wikipedia yeah, or something. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's, there's really <laughs> no roster. no rules, no guidelines to this other than we're going to go back and forth. Okay. And we're going to draft our top five. I'll let you start. I was going to ask if you wanted to go first no, or I'll second. No, I'll let you start. All right. So I will kick it off. And you you want to go snake? So you, you get two, three? Sure. Okay. I think that's only fair. Is Ben going to keep track? Ben's going to keep I can't track. I think <laughs> Yeah. So, Ben, when we get to five, tell us to stop. <laughs> we could probably right? talk about this for, you know, hours, but people want to hear from Greg and not, not, not us. Not us. Um, <laughs> so, with 1-1, one, one, there's, there's, no, there's no other way I could go. Um, I'm a diehard Phillies fan, but my favorite player of all time is Nomar Garcia Parra. Um, he's a retired number here. 
but it's really one of my first baseball memories. There are other p- people that I have on my list um, that I would also really love to have, but I my list would be incomplete without Nomar. So he's he's got to be All my right. one one. That that's a good one. I'm I'm gonna go back in the day too. I'll go 1994. I think I gotta go. Tony Clark, uh, first player to to hit the ball into the river, and um, you know uh, I and you came to these yeah. games way back, and uh, for my first experience, he was my you know that first player that that you remember yeah. coming here in 1994 as a fan. Yeah, so I'm gonna go Tony. All right, so there's your other one, and so we'll see him. The... I'll even tell him. Yeah. He was my number one when he comes to visit the ballpark. Yeah, maybe and, I did that. And hopefully, hopefully, reason. you know, a Tony Clark appearance on the podcast, you know, can can happen it's down the line. So let's weather permitting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're snaking. So you're up for another. Oh one. yeah, I'm up. Uh, so I'm going to keep it in the early days as well, just because I love this name. Um, yeah, I know. I, I knew it go. wasn't getting back around. So uh, it's, it's okay. got to go pork chop yeah. you, you know, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the chop. It's, it's yeah. probably the best Thunder name ever. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt, it's yeah. probably the, one of the best baseball. Names ever. I don't remember him. I remember him as a player. I, I couldn't tell you, like, you remember Tony Clark on yeah. the field, and I couldn't do that with Pork Chop, but I do remember coming to games and hearing his name calling. Oh, man, I wish I had a name like Pork Chop Pew. Right. It's a great name. Right. Great name. <laughs> All right. So it's me for two. Yep. Um, and I'm going to go uh, with another nostalgic pick. Um, and again, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, have my list without it. So I'm going to go with Aaron Judge. Um, And the reason I'm going with Judge is uh, my first year working with the Thunder was the 2015 season. Um, And we all know the iconic call from Adam uh, with the walk-off home run, opening night 2015. Couple outs, base is empty. The pitch, swing, and a drive deep to left field. Aaron Judge has walked us off. Three to two in the bottom of the tenth inning. The Trenton Thunder win their home opener. Uh, so my list would be incomplete without Nomar. My list would be incomplete without Aaron Judge. So he's he's going to be my second. Um, and then Still this is good where ones. yeah, this is this is where it gets um, it gets hard because there's a lot of names that I have. So I'm just going to keep going with my trend here and grabbing from different eras. I'm going to go with Alec Manoa. As my third pick, um, hosting AAA Toronto Blue Jays was uh, a very unique experience. Um, It was it was coming right out of COVID, so crazy times. Uh, So a little untraditional when you think of Thunder. What did we What did we have to buy him? What did he buy? Corn dogs. Corn dogs. Mini corn dogs. Yeah, I had to to have the food and bev staff. Uh, brew up some corn dogs for the for the guys in the clubhouse. Yeah, he would was, go up to the concession and come down with armfuls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was that was in, actually when he made his uh, big league debut I, I, and had his first win. I text some corn dogs yeah. for the clubhouse. He he got a kick out of that when he actually great guy too. Yeah, he got he back was. to us. He was that, he so. was he was great. So yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about Nomar Judge and Manoa. Okay, I'm gonna go with uh, this is he was he was a great guy, uh, good pitcher. Um, big league time with the Yankees and the Pirates, uh, but when he was here, he was just that guy that, you know, just an all-around good guy would have conversation with you, would help you with first pitches and any community events. Jeff Karstens, mm. uh, you know, one one of uh, those guys that that was just a, a great guy to have here um, for the organization. And uh, you know, I was lucky enough after uh, his first or second year, I, I he's from San Diego. I, I was going out there for vacation um, and was able to hang out with him. He, he we. We hung out for for a night, and he uh, was able to show me around some of the bars, and nice. uh, it was a good time. So that that was fun, uh, being able to to have him around, and then seeing him uh, move on to the Yankees and Pirates, and have a, uh, a really good big league career as well. Yeah, so absolutely, that was fun. Absolutely. Oh God, now I need a, a fourth. Um, a quick turnaround. I'm going to go with uh, uh, centered around. It was uh, the year after Aaron Judge, but but Judge had such a big following mm-hmm. as a prospect. So I'm going to. Uh, uh, Go the next year, Glaber Torres. Yes, he was on my uh, list as well. Just another one. Um, you know, we had Glaber. I think it was 2016. It was my first year as general manager, yeah. and the the hype was real. Um, he was in a trade, I believe. He wasn't a system guy for the Yankees, but he was brought over from the Cubs yeah, for in the Chapman deal. Yep. So um, it was really cool. We had a lot of autograph people uh, visit the ballpark yep. to try and get Glaber's autograph. So um, that that was another fun fun one to uh, to have. 
So my final two, and I have about seven or eight names on my list. So uh, one way or the other, I'm gonna feel like I left somebody out here, uh, a few people left out. Uh, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna kick it back to the early years, um, and, and it may have been uh, one of Nomar's double play partners. You you may remember it better. But I'm gonna go with Lou Merloni. Uh, just another, okay. you know, one that stands out from, uh, you know, being a youngster at the ballpark. Um, but yeah, you know, made it as a utility man in the major league level. Uh, but yeah, Lou Merloni uh, is going to be my number four, and my number five. Uh, man, there's there's a lot of good names, um, but I think I'm going to go with somebody that I believe, yes, was on our uh, 2019 championship team, and I'm going to go with another uh, infielder, uh, Hoy Park. Uh, you know, really got the crowd in, energized, you know, the, the cheers for hoy, 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 hoy. Um, so just, you know, a, again, the, the memories of the 2019 season, that championship run that we had. So I'll round out my list with Hoy Park. That's a good one. Um, I guess I'll – is it my last one? It it ben, mm -hmm. five? Five. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'll I'll go back to to my first year as an intern, um, 2004, and uh, our team was not good. But we really had a lot of good players <laughs> on that team. I don't know how they didn't win uh, many games, but uh, Robinson Cano mm. uh, was was on that team, and and obviously he had, ended up having a great career. So um, you know, I'll, I'll go Cano because it's so hard to. I was trying to think of. You know, I'll probably get down to my desk and be like, why didn't I pick him? Why didn't I pick him? Why didn't I pick him? So it's a good challenge. It was, this, it was, this was a good one. It was tough. not as good as the ballpark food. But it was good. <laughs> yeah, there were there were there were a couple other guys. You know, Jake Cave has always stood out to me, Dave. you know, especially now that he's you know been with the Phillies. Um, but he was always fun. The Eminem walk up songs are ones that just like stick with you. Uh, Chris Gittens, another one from the championship team, just all around good guy. But I mean, there's countless players when you've been around for 30 years. There's a lot of guys Tyler that are going to be yep, was here. Yep, notable yeah. Thunder players. I mean, you, you try and think back to the championship teams, the 07, 08, 13 and 19. And I mean, there was just so many guys on those teams. Yep. I mean, and then you have Jabba Chamberlain, yep. Ian Kennedy. Yep. That was a big one. Jabba would have been a good one as well to have on the I list. mean, so many, so many great players that have come through. Bill and, Hughes. And, uh, we, gonna, see, here yeah. I go. There I go. Sorry. Just go in the tent. We need to go to Caserta <laughs> or else I'm going to keep going. Well, let's just do that then. We could sit here reminisce all day. But uh, here's our interview with Greg Caserta. So looking over there, uh, Mr. Caserta, we're, we're thrilled to be to be talking to you. Um, you're looking good in that that rookie hat, advertising the brand, repping the brand as always. I'm just happy he found time for yeah, us. Yeah, right. He's big time. Yeah, now. yeah. That's what I was going to introduce him as. You know, MLB Network star. Uh, you know, food critic, reviewer. Like oh, yeah. you've got a lot of a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, with your with your busy life, but. You know, Greg, I, I really want to start off with, uh, are you a little bit ashamed of uh, your Trenton Thunder past? I mean, Jeff and I were doing some research reviewing your resume, and uh, there was definitely a, uh, a glaring gap uh, that didn't mention Trenton. So, you embarrassed by us, man? So, in, in the sake of transparency, not that we had like pre like a pre-interview or like a screening or anything like that, but it was brought to my attention that I might have missed a year on my resume. So I believe I had 2021 Trenton Thunder, 2022 was left blank. So if that's the case, then maybe it was just my performance in year one was really good. <laughs> and 2022, I just wanted to forget like it happened and it just kind of flushed from the memory. So, so it sounds like Ben Wolverton um, had some editing on your website mm -hmm. to cross off that that year. That, may, that makes sense. It's very sense. possible. That makes sense. It's very possible. And, you know, I think it was because there there comes a point where i'm like i don't want to go back into this website and have to add another year just building the website was a pain in the butt and as somebody that's not really that technologically sound um it it, it definitely took some time um but i think i could go back in and just tack on a year it's, it really won't be too bad well we could do that in post yeah like, that's i mean i mean like the business like we said, you're Mr. Big Time now, you know, at MLB Network. Um, you know, we're seeing you all the time and, and seeing your success. We joke about it, but obviously we're we're very proud of, of the career that you're continuing to have. Um, you know, there's been a – we talk about it all the time, the, the success of our broadcast 
team, uh, you know, through the years, and you're just another example of that. Uh, so we're very proud of, of the accomplishments that you've had here since you <clears> left Trenton. Um, obviously, we're going to joke around a lot today and, and hear some fun stories from you. But, um, Greg, welcome back to, uh, you know, your Thunder family here. Um, it's great to see you. Uh, but how's everything been for you since you uh, left Trenton? Um, you know, obviously, the, the fans may not be as locked in. So uh, your time at MLB Network, I'm sure you, you've seen a lot, done a lot, and, and had the opportunity to do some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, it, it happened very quickly where last year I was anticipating coming back to Trenton because at that point I was still only freelancing for MLB doing some smaller play-by-play -play events. And then in late February last year, they had a couple of changes on their roster and they kind of enlisted me last minute to do the Andre Dawson Classic, which was held down in New Orleans. It's a historically black college and university event that they hold every year. And that was the biggest event that I did for them up to that point because it actually aired on MLB Network. And my first couple of events with them, they were webcasts only. They were on MLB.com. And that's not to take away from the importance or the preparation that I put in. But when you're on the main channel, we had a Friday doubleheader. I had a lot of pressure on me to perform. And I thought it went really well. And uh, as you guys know, I was working at the radio station at the time in New York City. I was doing updates at WFAN and CBS Sports Radio on the national side. Went for a couple of jobs with the Yankees and Mets because that's the, they're the flagship station and came up short with both teams. And so at that point, I kind of realized like, all right, I've kind of reached my ceiling at the radio station. But I do think that I could be doing more at MLB Network. So I put together a tape very quickly from that event in New Orleans, I sent it to some people that I knew over there and basically said, listen, I feel like I could be doing more. Um, that event in particular was kind of hectic because there's always guests popping in the booth. You have uh, on-field interviews with the managers. And I just thought, look at how I interact with the people coming into the booth. I felt like I was more than just a play-by-play -play guy at that point. I felt like I could be doing more. And the timing was just perfect because they needed people. They lost a couple of guys uh, that previous off season. You know, initially they were going to bring me on for two days a week um, to host a red zone style show that aired on Wednesdays and Fridays. And from there, more opportunities just kept popping up. So it went from two days to four days. And by the time we got into the second half of the season last year, I was there five, six days a week, um, mostly in studio stuff probably did one play-by-play -play event for them every month and then got a, an extension once my contract expired at the end of 2023, got a multi-year extension and now I'm back full time. So it's nice to have that kind of security because it's the first time I've ever had a real contract, you know, like doing the minor league thing as long as I did, you go from freelance job to freelance job, you're basically living like a nomad six months at a time. So to have the security to be in one place and to have a steady schedule, um, it, you know, it's the dream job. I mean, it really is. And uh, it's a great place to be. Uh, the, the, my, my coworkers there are fantastic and it's 30 minutes from my house in Secaucus. So it really is the perfect scenario of everything coming together at the right time. You also had a little bit of uh, the opportunity to step into Jeff Passon's shoes this off season. You got to break your own contract extension Obviously, um, the free agency moves this off season were were slow, um, but it was it was a big breakthrough the day of your contract. Yeah, I, I put a little thought into it. It's not my style. Like I'm very much new to Instagram, and I'm still not great at it. But just from talking with somebody at our agency that kind of handled the social media stuff at the time we had a, a call about it and she's like listen you've got to use your instagram more you've got to use it to promote and again it's not my style i don't like doing that like to me it's just a job i just need to know what time and where and i'm going to show up and i'm going to do it but we're in this world now where unless you get follows and unless you have people liking your stuff you kind of fall by the wayside. So like I've seen it with my own coworkers at MLB. They have people that do their stuff for them. I'm clearly not at that level yet, but I felt like, all right, let me have some fun with this. And yeah, it was cool because it really got a nice response from people. Like I heard from a lot of people that 
Um, I haven't talked to in a while. Um, I, I, I don't even think I have 600 followers on Instagram, so I still have a long ways to go. Uh, but to put that together was fun. Um, to edit it all at the end, like I said, going back to my, my technological uh, insufficiencies before, I had it all filmed. I was ready to release it at six o'clock on some random day. I think I finally released it after seven because I wasn't able to like put it all together and then release it the way I wanted to. Um, so I'm still learning that aspect of it. But yeah, once in a while, let's get to have some fun. Um, Bods, you always tease me about some of my my screaming rants from when I was doing updates <laughs> on the radio. So um, now that I know that T-shirts were made as a result of that, I feel like I need more of those viral moments to happen. Yeah, let's 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 talk about that because that captivated the Trenton Thunder front office. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> he knows no limits. <laughs> it's 5.30 in the morning. This fake enthusiasm is excruciating. <laughs> but I don't want to talk over. about the business. So what would you recommend? I don't care. I woke up 40 minutes ago. I slept for two hours. I don't want to deal with it! Hubba hubba. <laughs> you, you've had a, a few moments. Um... You know, uh, is it is it just that it's five o'clock in the morning and you really haven't had your coffee yet and you just you can't take it? I mean, there's been plenty of moments, you know, where, where I'm in my car listening to sports talk radio that I'm doing literally the same thing. But I don't have a camera in front of my face. <laughs> you you do. Um, you know, obviously, friends and family are going to be reaching out to you. But what what was the overall feedback of, you know, that that uh, little outburst, as you called it? You know, the the one thing that stands out, well, there's two things that stand out. One is you constantly beating me up for that. You, I think, had more fun with that than anybody, Bods, which, which was funny because I would get reminded of that from time to time. But I remember that morning my mom texted me and she's like, are you are you OK? Like, are, is everything OK? And I'm like, yeah, like you drum it up for the radio. Yeah. Like with TV, like you said, like there's a performance aspect of it. But like if you're calling a game you're calling a game. If you're in studio, you're going from this segment to this segment. Like there's not a lot of performance that goes into it. With the radio show that I was doing, I was playing, I don't wanna say a character, yeah. but like you feed into certain things sometimes. And that particular day, there was some truth to it. There was a guy that worked there that annoyed the hell out of everybody. And he was annoying me that day. <laughs> But I also had a lot of frustration working at that radio station because I was still working there. And like I said before, I got passed over for jobs with both the Mets and Yankees. So like my boiling point there, I loved working on the show, but like all the other stuff that was going on behind the scenes really made me mad. And I felt the best way to do that was to bring it to the radio. Um, you know, to me, honest radio was always the best thing. So like... I listen to Howard Stern. I listen to Opie and Anthony. Those guys always railed on management and I would do it in a certain way. I would never address it directly, but I kind of funneled my my actual anger into something that I thought would be entertaining. And sure enough, um, it, I got T-shirts made out of it. So clearly well, it, it worked. It was entertaining for us. I will say that <laughs> we enjoyed seeing it. And then and then uh, my, my other favorite one was, I believe it was about Anthony Rendon correct yeah, yeah that was that was a great one and he's been in the news recently so to get a little bit of baseball talk in here what obviously baseball players go through such a demanding schedule um but anthony rendon has really been under fire since he signed the large agreement with the angels um it, you know you you have a demanding schedule we have a demanding schedule we know what the sports industry and then obviously these guys on top of it so what is your opinion on What's going on with Anthony Rendon and, and his current situation with the Angels? You know, I go back and forth on it because initially I was like, man, this guy just can't help himself. Like ever since he left Washington, he was the World Series playoff hero. He has a career year and a contract year. And at that time, he really was one of my favorite players because I don't think people really knew about the off the field stuff that like his heart just hasn't been in it. Um, Jonathan Papelbon just came out with something recently where they were teammates in Washington and Papelbon said like being in that role end of my career I would see guys go in and out of the training room and he basically said I knew this guy was locked in on a certain day most guys are locked in on days but then there's times when you leave the training room and you're like I just don't have it 
And so Papelbon said, like, the one guy that, like, was never really there was Rendon. Like, he just got away with pure talent, pure athletic ability. And I always liked the guy. I thought, you know, power hitting third baseman, great glove. And then he goes to Washington, and you kind of see what he is. He's just the guy that I do respect the honesty. He said, like, this is not something that I'm passionate about. This is a job. This is what pays the bills. This is how I support my family. And, I mean, he can support 100 families with the money that he's made. Um, if you're an Angels fan, you're probably furious. If you're a teammate, I don't know how thrilled you are. I, I do appreciate the fact that he went on a a, a smaller show and was very honest about it. You know, like I thought that was refreshing, but it, it kind of just opened a window into like, all right, there are guys, believe it or not, that even if they're making 35, 36 mil a year, they don't really care. Um, and as somebody that's kind of always put my heart and soul into everything that I do work-wise, um, you know, that's, I don't want to say a slap in the face, but I do think it undermines people that work really hard to get to where they are. Um, so I do see both sides of it. I understand why there are people that that really have an issue with it. I also understand that there are people that go, oh, who cares? Like, you know, I, I see both sides of it for sure. So, Greg, you've uh, you've had a great career so far, and, and you're obviously still, you know, probably at the, the front end of your career. But So let's rewind the clock a little bit. Uh, did you know that this was always going to be your path? Were you a, you know, 11 12 year old sitting in front of your tv broadcasting mlb the show games like you know when did you realize that you had the talent for this and and knew that this was going to be a career option for you i didn't go back that far i always tell the story that in high school i think it was after my sophomore year of high school my mom found a newspaper ad for the bruce beck and iron eagle sports broadcasting camp it was a five-day camp during the summer at montclair state university my mom said, hey, I think you should do this. And I was like, no, I have no interest. And then she's like, all right, you're not doing it this summer, but next year I'm signing you up. And I just said, yeah, okay, fine. And then I went and I did it. And I remember, you know, kind of doing some very preliminary stuff. Like you would write a sports report and then you would sit at a desk and deliver it. Um, I remember the final thing that we did that year we went to a Newark Bears game at the time, and we were able to call a couple of innings of a Newark Bears game sitting in the seating bowl into a tape recorder. And I remember at that point being like, all right, this is fun. I like this. And then I went back a second summer to the camp. And that's when I kind of realized, like, all right, this is what I want to pursue. I applied to six or seven different colleges. Fordham University was the only one I wanted to go to. And I wanted to go there because they had a great radio station and they gave you the opportunity to get on air. When I got there, you're basically an intern. You do a little bit of everything behind the scenes stuff. All your broadcasts are done at the time into tape recorders. And then you would send it to your boss and he would critique it. And eventually you would hope that as, let's say, a sophomore or junior, you could get on the air at Fordham and do some of the bigger sports, football, basketball, baseball, softball. I did my first football demo as a freshman standing on the roof of the press box and I did it into a tape recorder. I don't even remember who I did it with, but I did the first half of that game. And then a short time later, we did these work, these weekly workshops where we would have industry professionals come in and critique our tapes. And I remember Dave Sims, who's now the TV voice of the Seattle Mariners. At the time, he was doing Sunday Night Football on the radio for Westwood One. And he listened to my first ever football demo. He goes, uh, this is your first one? Yeah. You're a freshman? Yeah, he goes, keep at it. And that was kind of the first thing that I needed to hear where it kind of gave me the confidence. And listen, with the minor league thing that I did, it's not something that a lot of people have done, you know, to do minor league baseball for 10 plus years. I always reference living in six states in seven years at one point. Um, that was a different path. And there were certainly a lot of bumps along the way. But there were these mile markers in my career where I was like, yeah, I got this. Like it clicked one day in 2015 and then it clicked again in 2019. And so my mentality was I certainly have the talent and the skills to do this. I just never thought I had the luck or the timing or the break that needs to come with it. And, you know, I was lucky enough that I waited long enough and things broke the right way. And now here I am. 
Um, certainly not where I expect it to be if we had had this conversation two or three years ago. So you're you're going through Fordham and you're you're doing the, some of the games, but you're you're coming to the end of your Fordham University career, and now it's time to start looking like you mentioned a minor league baseball career. It seems like that was the path that you wanted to go into. Take us back to how that first started, what your process was, how many demos you're sending out, <laughs> and then uh, 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 your minor league career. Because I see, except you know, missing Trenton, that you have uh, like you mentioned, go. <laughs> a, a nice roadmap. But you know, I, obviously, John and I, we sit here and we see a lot of emails come in of broadcasters interested, and I applaud them for being aggressive and sending uh, their demos and their resumes. You're a kid in college. What was your process and, and how was that process for you uh, in terms of finally latching on to a, to a minor league team? I got a late start with that because there were guys, and it's happened, you notice it even more now where you see guys that are in college and a lot of times they get summer jobs calling games for summer collegiate teams. That was something that I should have done when I was in college, but I chose not to. Like I was living in New York at the time my apartment was in the Bronx. I was living with my college buddies. So we would live at Fordham and I would work at the radio station. I was there a couple of days a week. And then I would intern at, let's say, ESPN Radio was one of my internships. So like during the summers in college, when I should have probably been starting to do baseball, I wasn't, but I was working. And so my first baseball job wasn't until the year after I graduated college. That was 2011. And I kind of got a late start in the hiring process. Like at the time, I didn't know what the window was for minor league baseball. I was hoping to get a job in the Cape Cod League. It didn't happen because I don't remember, like I remember talking to a couple of teams, but for whatever reason, things didn't happen. But then somebody said, well, there's this other league in New England, the New England Collegiate Baseball League. And that's when I got my first job. And from there, I ended up in St. Paul. Um, which at the time was independent. They were the probably the premier independent team in baseball. And then that really jump-started me into affiliated ball because at the time it was the Gold Clan group that ran the St. Saint Paul Saints, but they also had other teams, one of them being the Hudson Valley Renegades. Through the ownership group, the Renegades were looking for somebody in 2013. That was my first year in affiliated baseball. So that's 2013. That was short season at the time. And I remember after that thinking, okay, I need to make a jump to do more games. Like, you know, 76 games in a, a New York Penn League schedule was fine, but I felt like, I don't know, like, I don't know if this was the right mentality, but I felt like I should do what the players and the coaches should be doing. Um, I should be climbing up the ladder the way they are. Um, I remember going to the winter meetings that year, and I remember meeting Tyler Murray, who's now with the Worcester Red Sox. Um, really good broadcaster. He was in the Florida State League at the time. And he goes, hey, um, look at Port Charlotte. I don't really know what their deal is, but they might be looking for a broadcaster. And when I reached out to the GM there, um, this was actually around the time I first came to Trenton to interview for the radio job in Trenton. Um, Hudson Valley, no, beg your pardon, the Charlotte Stone Crabs needed an answer from me. And uh, the, the GM told me on my first phone call, he's like, listen, the job's yours, but I can't pay you anything. <laughs> so I said, all right, uh, when do I start? And, and that was year one with them. I ended up going back a second year in 2015 and then just continued to climb. Um, Thunder Connection 2016, I worked with Jay Burnham in Richmond. That was my first year in the Eastern League. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed my time there, but I also wanted to be closer to home. Uh, because I was gone for half the year and really didn't get an opportunity to come back. Three years in Reading, then the pandemic, and then uh, even though it doesn't say it on my resume, two years with you guys. So um, I, you know, spent four years. How many years in Double A? Yeah, four years in Double A in the Eastern League. And I did want to say this while I was on this podcast that I used to hate coming to Trenton. Uh, oh, it's because to make sense now. <laughs> <laughs> I, now it's all coming together. I'm back. I used to hate coming there because I wasn't used to the radio booth being lower than some of the other booths that I was used to in the league. So I felt like I didn't really do my best when I called games there. The other aspect of it was, at least for my three years in Reading, Trenton used to whoop Reading. 
like there were there was a rivalry. It was a fun um, ride. I know rest. that it was a fun one. Players did not like each other. Yep. I think in 2019, the managers did not like each other. And then in 2019, Redding goes to the playoffs, gets knocked out very quickly by the Thunder. They go on to win the Eastern League. So it was like they were always like the big brother that was beating up on the teams that I was with. So like going there was always like, man, I hope we can like take a series off these guys. Like that was a big thing. Like if you could take a series off Trenton. Like, all right, we got some momentum going into next week. Didn't happen very often, though. Um, so I spent a lot of time in that ballpark before I ever actually started working there. Well, let's let uh, you mentioned it, so let's let's go back to 2019 and and Reading and Trenton have a unique tie because we're about an hour and 15, hour and 30 minutes, so almost like travel partners back then in the, in the Eastern yep. League, and and we played each other a lot. What was that rivalry like? You were in the clubhouses and on the field for for BP, and you mentioned it a little. The teams, which you don't see very often in minor league baseball, because it's more, you know, you're trying to get ready, you're trying to move up and get to the bigs. But this was almost like the atmosphere where the teams just didn't like each other. No, and it was unique no, they for minor league baseball. And, and it was legit. I mean, it really was. I mean, you had 12 teams in the Eastern League. You would play 10 of them and be like, all right, just another series. And at the time, this was before they started doing six game series. I'd be curious to see what that's like moving forward, because you really get tired of each other if you play a five or six game series. But you would play usually four against each other. And it it was big. I mean, I don't want to say it was like a playoff game, but like you knew, like, all right, we're, we're going to be up for these games, you know, like no offense to some of the other teams in the league, but like there just wasn't as much buzz or excitement when you played Trenton. It was like, all right, let, let's try and let's try and beat these guys. Um, as you guys know, you know, minor league baseball is not about wins and losses. It's about player development. That's what they always tell you. But I know that guys really wanted to beat the Thunder. I know that Thunder guys really wanted to beat Redding. And again, when when you have it where, you know, the coaching staffs don't like each other, I mean, for me, I, I thought it was great. It, it was great theater. It was great drama. Um, you know, I looking back, those were some of the most fun games I've ever broadcasted. I just don't think my win-loss record uh, was very good in those three years. So let's, let's talk about 2020. Obviously, a, a really difficult time for the world, but... Um, you know, when we when we look at it for our industry specifically, um, you know, the canceled minor league season, a lot of, you know, furloughs, layoffs, uh, people changing career paths, you know, uh, where was your head at during that time? Um, you know, as you're kind of thinking about you, you've been in minor league sports for a long time, transitioning the next steps in your career, the next steps in your life. Um, you know, where was your head at during that during that period? So the timing was strange because in 2019, I did a Phillies spring training game on MLB.com. Phillies were really cool about that. They let their minor league broadcasters come down, usually parachute in and do a game or two, like a web a webcast of a spring training game. So in 2019, I went down to Bradenton and called a game on radio between the Phillies and Pirates in Bradenton. It was me, Scott Fransky, and Kevin Franzen at the time. And that was my first real taste of major league broadcasting. And I thought I did well. I enjoyed it. I had a great time. But I was like, man, like if I could just do one more, like I know I knew at the end of 2019, like I was right on the cusp because I saw my development. I saw how better, how much better I got in 2019. I felt like I was this close. And then in 2020, I was at the airport. I was at my gate getting ready to fly back down to spring training to do another Philly spring training game. And as I'm waiting for my flight, this is when everything's starting to come out with COVID. You had Rudy Gobert test positive in the NBA. You, I think you had the San Jose Sharks cancel a couple of games in the NHL. And while I was at the airport is when they canceled spring training. So I was seeing tweets from Passan and Rosenthal. And I'm like, well, I got friends that are down there. Like I was going to make it like a work slash guys trip. But at that point, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go home. And I circled back from Newark Airport. I came home. And that's when they canceled spring training. And by extension of that, the minor league baseball season. And it was tough. Um, you know, like I, I've told this story before, I ended up working at Amazon for a full calendar year, unloading trucks. And to be honest, 2021 was gonna be my last go. Like I was applying for different MBA programs. 
I didn't know what my plan was, but I felt like if I got my degree, I could then figure it out and go from there. And if it wasn't for Jeff throwing me that lifeline, I probably wouldn't be in the business. Um, you know, Redding informed me that they were eliminating my position six weeks before opening day in 2021. Um, you know, and, and the timing of that was not good. Um, but fortunately, I had heard from somebody that Trenton might be looking. And I'll never forget the conversation because Jeff and I spoke on the phone and he said to me, listen, we have an offer out right now to the guy that would have been here in 2020. He lives up in New England, though and he might be staying up there he goes i can't promise you anything he goes if the kid takes the job i can't really help you but if he stays home it's yours and then i waited for i don't know a week and a half maybe and then i never forget it i was in the dunkin donuts parking lot i was getting an iced coffee and i get a call from jeff and it, it really is like one of the like very major moments in my life where i answered the phone knowing that this is either going to be a yes, the job is yours or a no, which could very well spell the end of my career. Um, because at that point, I had even offered to Redding, like, listen, this is my last go of it. Like, I'm I'm giving it one more season to give this thing a shot. I just need one more season's worth of tape. Um, I'll come work for free. And they they nixed that idea. Jeff calls me up and says, great news. The, uh, the job is yours. And uh, also, we're getting AAA baseball here. Uh, because the Buffalo Bisons are coming and uh, they're going to be using our ballpark for a, a pretty decent amount of time. So not only do I get a job in one phone call, but I also get a promotion to AAA, which at that point I had never called AAA baseball. So it really was an amazing phone call. Um, and for the first time, I was able to call games in New Jersey. Like after all this time of working in all these different states, I was able to stay home and uh, it really it saved my career, which is why um, even though it's not on my resume, I will be forever loyal <laughs> to that organization and to you guys because it it allowed me to be where I am now. Um, if it wasn't for that phone call, if it wasn't for Jeff, I probably would not be in the business anymore. So then the the 2021 season, obviously a lot of fun here being able to host um, AAA baseball and prior to us starting recording, I, I said, is anything off the table? Because <laughs> my my favorite Greg Caserta story, and I'm gonna let you tell it, Greg, involves Rowdy Telez. Um, and it's, I'll just let you take it from there. All right, so Rowdy's with the Pirates now, I believe. I believe, I believe so, he yeah. Left the Brewers. He's he been here. One yeah, year Rowdy was here such a short time. I think he hit the most balls in the river too. The yeah, I think so. Oh yeah, he was. It was he crazy. Was. And the talent on that that Bison's team, you know, was incredible. Incredible. I mean, being able to watch that, uh, you know, for the games that we had them. I mean, you know, Kevin Smith has been up with uh, a big league team. Yeah. Um, obviously, Alec Manoa and the the success he had. Um, to Les, um, you don't you don't realize it's crazy. People always say, "Oh, double A and triple A." Uh, there, there's definitely there's a difference, but you're like, ah, you know, what's the difference? And then you see it, and you're like, okay, there is a difference. You know? Oh yeah, it's it's 100. I mean, there's plenty of double A guys that you look at and you go, that guy's not making the majors, right? Like we we've know guys like that. You know, they, they they're good guys, but like you just know that it's not there. Whereas you look at most triple A teams, and you're like, yeah, 90 plus percent of those guys, if they haven't been in the majors already, they will be. Um, I also remember with that, like, we were really spoiled with the coaching staff that we had. Great staff. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that the players took to the whole situation really well uh, because it was not easy for them, basically, coming to a new place without any real ties. And I give the Bisons credit, too. Like, we talked about it, guys. Like, we were in the front office. Like, how great the Bisons were to work with as a front office, the way there was that exchange and that back and forth. Um, you know, the Thunder Bisons, the guys had the T-shirts made. And if you look like their record yeah. here at home that year was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, it was a really interesting chapter in Trenton Thunder history. Um, you know, right now it's it's the one time that there's been triple A baseball there. And it really was. I, the only regret I have is that we didn't get that final month with them. Mm -hmm. It would have been cool to see how that team finished out to play the full year there. But um, we got really lucky with some really good guys um, and, and Rowdy Telez to, to tell that story quickly. I called a lot of his games because he was in New Hampshire. 
I even called his games in Dunedin when he was in high A. And I always liked Rowdy Telez because from afar, I think he was like a 30th round pick out of high school. He wasn't a guy that had a lot of fanfare. I don't know if he was ever a top 30 prospect. And this dude could just mesh. I mean, he was a giant guy who hit for serious power. And then he's with us in Buffalo. And I had always heard that he could be a, a tricky guy to get to know and a tricky guy to interview. Um, but my interactions with him were always pretty decent. You know, like we didn't have a lot of long conversations, but I never remembered him being bald. Like I, I always remembered him coming up like having hair, but like as somebody that always wears a hat to cover his hair, I guess I now sympathize a little bit more. Um, so one day I'm, I'm in the booth and he takes his helmet off in the dugout and it, like, he's really bald. Like he is like shaved down bald. And I refer to him as a cue ball, <laughs> which I don't think I've ever said about anybody before or since. Um, and then after the game, I'll never forget coming down to the front office and I'm getting ready to write my post game recap. And it might have been you, Bods, or somebody who's like, hey, uh, Rowdy Telez is looking for you, which that's never happened to me in 10 plus years. I've had probably one brush up with a player every other year. You say something that they don't like, something that gets referred back to them from a girlfriend, a family member, and you always explain yourself and you realize that you're not trying to bury anybody or screw anybody and uh you know you usually squash it but this was one of those rare times the only time where the player came into the front office and goes where's the radio guy and of course it's rowdy telez who's 6'4 you know 240 pounds i then go into the clubhouse to seek him out and he is not happy at all uh, you know and he used some language that i can't share here you know <laughs> what the f was that and i just explained like listen Maybe I said the wrong thing to you. Maybe you didn't hear it the right way. It was not a knock by any means. Like if you listen to me call games, I'm a fan of yours. And I explained that to him. Like I was really doing a lot of damage control to be like, listen, man, I've called your games for a long time. I like you. I think you're an awesome story. Maybe I should have used a different term and we eventually squashed it, but I'm sure if I saw him now, he probably wouldn't like me too much. I don't think he would give me the friendliest <laughs> greeting. Um, Cause I remember when he and I were having it out in the clubhouse again, it was, I think more respectful for me than it was from him. Like he said what he had to say. It was almost like he was getting into an argument with an umpire. So again, he let everything fly. Nate Pearson was standing right next to him. So I'm looking at two of the biggest guys in that clubhouse. And I think as long as you're accountable, as long as you explain yourself, then it's okay. Because I've had similar situations before. And I think as long as you show up and explain yourself, I think that's the biggest thing. I think if I had ducked them or tried to weasel out of it, then um, then that would have been a problem. But I said, listen, man, I, I goofed up. We're not perfect. You know, you say a lot during a course of a three-hour broadcast. Sometimes there's stuff that you'd like to have back um, in retrospect. I didn't think it was all that bad, but listen, some guys take things a certain way. And in that situation, um, calling giant Rowdy till as a cue ball was not my uh, my best decision at that time. So I, I know we're, we're running out of a little bit of time. We still have a couple more things uh, we want to go over with you, Greg. But I think in 2021, you being uh, here in Trenton and, and being able to do uh, the AAA games, you also got to call up uh, yourself. Uh, you know, you were able to do a, a series with the, the New York Mets on radio. So uh, tell us a little bit about that, how that came about and, and what that experience was like. So that was the other moment, Jeff, like 2021. Again, I reference you bringing me on and giving me that last lifeline. And then the thing that I think propelled me beyond that point was getting the opportunity to call those two Mets games. Um, I knew the Mets executive producer, Ray Martell, for a very long time. He was a friend of mine. He and I worked together at Long Island University uh, calling basketball games. And he always said, like, listen, um, I may need you at some point. And initially, I thought it was going to be for a pre and post game role. And I don't even know why it happened this way, because it was the only two games I ever did for them. But he texted me the morning of May 5th. 
yeah, it was May 5th, my brother's birthday, and I was home, and he's like, just be by your phone today. And he's never said that to me before. And then I got to the ballpark, drove down, calls me up a little after 12 noon and says, um, he goes, what are you doing June 4th and 5th, Friday, Saturday? I go, well, I got Trenton Thunder games. Um, but why? What's up? He goes, uh, you're going to be calling two Mets games. And I was like, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, and I, you know, I never really expected it to be that. I Again, I thought it was going to be, all right, I'll do some pre and post. And at least I get that on tape. And then you couple that with the Thunder play by play and it puts together a nice reel. Um, and when I called those two games, it was like, all right, I finally made it. Um, you know, like I knew of other guys that have had the opportunity. I was on cloud nine and I really thought like, all right, this is the greatest summer of my life. And then when the off season came about in 2021, I, I just had this, like, I crashed almost like I was on this high from doing these two Mets games. But what helped was that a family friend who works at MLB network, huge Mets fan. He, um, he was listening and he texted me and he goes, dude, unbelievable. And I think that's kind of what got me on their radar because that July, later July, I got a text from somebody at MLB saying, hey, would you like to do this event for us? It's the RBI World Series down in Vero Beach. Now, I had been in contact with MLB Network, but I was always told, yeah, you know, just keep getting reps, keep getting reps. And you hear that so much that it's like, all right, they're just kind of giving you lip service. I actually had to text the guy to be like, is this a joke? Like, you really, you're really asking me to do this event for you guys. And it, it, it was, it was for real. So I went down to Vero, I did this event. And if it wasn't for my producer down there, Chris Bracey, I don't know if I would have continued on at MLB because I poured my heart and soul into that game, realizing that you never know when these opportunities are going to pop up. If you're ever going to get that opportunity again, treat everyone like it's a game seven and it went well um you know looking back two years i think the product has gotten much better now in terms of what i'm putting out there but if it wasn't for chris bracy um he really pushed hard for me like he went back to his bosses and said listen i think we've got something here with this guy i think that we can get him in on the ground floor kind of develop him kind of mold him and that was really the first thing i ever did with mlb so you know again it's 2021 is the is really the turning point of being on my way out, having one foot out the door, getting the call from Jeff, doing the Mets games, doing the first event with MLB and, um, you know, just making the most of those opportunities. Um, you know, like I, I can't say that I am the most talented broadcaster in terms of how I sound, what I say, what I look like. But I've always said that I won't be outworked. Like, I will always prepare for every game like it's the only one I'm going to get a chance to do. And I think that's what's allowed me to be successful is, um, you know, to take those opportunities and to not be nervous because I know that I'm as prepared as I'll ever be and that um, I don't really leave any stone unturned. Well, I think we're definitely going to need a, a part two to this interview. I think we could sit here and, and talk to you and catch up. Radio all day. guys just can yeah, talk and is, talk and talk. But we want to be respectful of your it. time, Greg. Um, <laughs> Got to realize I miss it, man. Like being yeah. being on the other side now, being on TV. It's like, all right, I've got to pick my spots to get in and out. I come from a tradition of just rambling for three hours. So the fact that I get to do this is like, but it's a good, I, I, it I miss, no. it's, it's a good, no, I think, I think uh, we could, I think we could sit here and, and, and talk baseball and, and well, obviously we could talk about Greg all day long. What, what we'll do is we'll continue this another, another day over a pint. Yep. Greg signed the multi-year extension, so he's exactly. going to pay. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, no, but uh, it, hearing these stories, it, it brings back, because we used to talk about this yeah. back in 2021 and 2022, yeah. and, and obviously you moving on to MLB Network, which is fantastic. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's great to see your success, and, yes. and we're proud of you, and uh, you're always Thunder family. We appreciate you wearing the Thunder merch as well and promoting our, our store. So, no, we Boys. appreciate it. It's always great uh, hearing stories from you, Greg. Hey, Greg, we have, a, we have a surprise for you in just a minute, but before yeah. while we get set up for that, um, just real quick, you know, <clears throat> tell us what's going on right now, what you've got coming up. Um, you know, if you want to share your, your social media, I know you're, you're trying to, you know, grow it. Uh, as oh, we yeah. talked about at the beginning. So uh, what do you got coming up and, and where can people find you? 
So the socials are now Greg Caserta, MLB, uh, G-R-E-G-G, and then one S in Caserta. Usually everybody flip-flops it. There's usually one G, two S's. Um, so you can find me on uh, on Twitter and Instagram. I don't call it X. It's still Twitter. Um, but I use my Instagram a lot more. I used to be a prolific tweeter, but not as much these days. Right now in March, starting Sunday, I will be in studio five days a week, basically I'm what you call the bridge show guy. I get you to the start of the first spring training game at one o'clock. That game ends, and then I get you to the start of the four o'clock game out in the Cactus League. So depending on the length of the game, if the game ends at 3.30, I will fill for 30 minutes up until first pitch of the next game. I love doing that because it allows me to do a little bit of everything. It gives me a chance to like sit behind the desk and really develop that skill set, which is probably where I'm least developed because I just haven't done it the most. And then starting the last Friday of the month, I think that's the 29th, I'm back on Strike Zone every Wednesday and Friday. That's from 7 to 10. That's our Red Zone style show um, that we do for DirecTV and certain cable outlets. And then two or three days a week, I'll be hosting Big Inning, which is our real, like that's our baby. That's, that's our real Red Zone style show. Um, we show four games at once. I'm basically like the Scott Hansen of that, where I get you from game to game, at bat to at bat. The, the premise being big players, big moments, big inning. Um, so you're going to see every Otani at bat, every judge at bat. And if let's say there's a boring game going on, let's say you got the Tigers and the Guardians. If the Guardians have the bases loaded in the eighth inning and they're down a run, we're going to show you that too. So it's, I think, the new way that people are consuming it and watching it. I love hosting it because it's three hours nonstop. And uh, like uh, like you guys just alluded to, I have no problem talking. So uh, it's, a, it's a fun one for me to do uh, because I can pick my spots to jump in, sprinkle in a little play-by-play, but really just be the traffic cop to get you from game to game. Fantastic. You made Liz smile behind the camera <laughs> hearing uh, those memories of MLB Network. Oh, yeah. Well, we hope everybody checks checks you out, Greg. I, I know we do. Um, like we said, we're, <clears throat> we're thrilled with the success of your career. Uh, we're very proud of you. We're looking forward to, um, you know, catching up more. We're definitely going to have to have you back on, uh, you know, the podcast. But we did promise you yeah. something special here. Um, this is top secret information that we're about to share with you. Uh, the Thunder fans don't know. Uh, that they will be finding out in the not-so-distant future, but you're the first person uh, outside of the walls to get to uh, see and experience uh, what we've got cooked up. Our Obviously, our front office staff works very, very hard behind the scenes uh, during the course of the offseason, as you know. Uh, we've got we've got something special planned for this season. So, Liz, I'm going to ask you to turn off all the cameras. We don't even want this content captured. This is for... Uh, this is for Greg's eyes only. So I feel like I'm seeing it for the first time. I'm excited. <laughs> so, uh, Greg, you know this is this is for your eyes only. But we're we're going to okay. share something with you here that we're very excited about, and I think you're going to like it. And I think the Thunder fans are going to like it too. So um, let's just see. Uh, let's get your reactions here to to what we got going on. Can you can you see what I'm holding here? Put it up a little. I think I have an idea. Liz, Put it up a little closer. Out, uh, a little bit. Sure, sure. Okay. I got. It. So we, he's got a big smile on his face. Obviously, yeah. uh, with the cameras off, there is uh, no video here. But Greg, you think the the Thunder fans are going to be pretty happy with uh, what you're seeing right now? Yeah, yeah. Because I look at it as like, all right, would I wear those? And I, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a hat like the one. I don't have a hat like the other one. Um, yeah, I. You you guys nailed it. Liz is gonna hold we up one, one more. We got thing one more too. thing for you. Um, like I said, a teaser went out this past weekend, uh, so the the fans have a little bit of okay. a, a little bit of a glimpse. Um, now I now I understand because I had a question about. Yeah. Now I got it. Okay. So, so this will be this will be coming th- uh, soon for Thunder fans. So wow. obviously they got to stay locked into our social channels. Uh, but we're really excited about this. Like I said, Greg, you're the you're the first one laying eyes on this. So. One out of ten. What, what yeah, one out of ten. Where how are you ranking this? So I mean, I always say like it's hard to give a ten to something because then you could never go up beyond that. 
So, so you're going to give us an 11. Nine five? <laughs> nine, five. nine five? Okay. Nine five. Okay. We love it. We'll take it. We because love it. I love it. I absolutely, absolutely love it. Awesome. Well, great. We're happy to share it with you. We know Thunder fans are going to love it coming up. So oh, yeah. uh, they're going to have to keep uh, keep in tune with all of our social channels. But um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Can't wait to see you in it for sure. Um, about it. That'll have to happen. But Greg, again, thank you so much um, You know, for your time today. It was um, great to catch up with you. Uh, like Jeff said, you're always a member of our Thunder family. Um, super pumped to watch you on MLB Network, see where your career continues to grow. Uh, but hopefully you're you're out here at the ballpark this year. We can see you um, catch up in person. Uh, but good luck the rest of this spring. And, uh, you know, thank you again for, for chatting with us a little bit. Always. Like I said, when, when Jeff extended the invite, I was like, yeah, I've been waiting. Like, I want to get on there, you know, like I know <laughs> you guys are two, man. I'm so, two. We're so you know, sorry. Like, <laughs> I, it's so I'm no, I was ecstatic. You know, I love you guys. Um, you know, two very, very special and important years. Um, you know, I love you guys. And yeah, uh, to, you know, to be reminded that I'm always a part of the family. It's like, I know, but to hear it is always special. So, uh, you know I love you guys, and I'll definitely be seeing you sooner than later. All right, thanks, buddy. We'll, we'll talk see you to you soon. soon. Good luck this year. You got it, guys. The Field of Thunder podcast, the official podcast of the Trenton Thunder, is produced by Liz Sikorsky and Ben Wolverton and recorded live in Trenton, New Jersey. For information on tickets, promotion, and all things Thunder, visit trentonthunder.com. Subscribe to Field of Thunder on Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, or wherever you find your podcasts.